my name is uh, Johan Bichot. This is uh, Philippe Marshall. We, and Bill is also on the course. He's sitting in the audience, trying to keep a close eye on you guys. I'm a good portrait. <laughs> so the idea of uh, this tutorial, or talk tutorial style, is to dive into a bit of the advanced topics of uh, Seaside, but of course there's a limited uh, time frame. So um, I'll first go through an application together with you, um, where we will be moving from like a standard uh, page rendering web page Seaside application to a Seaside application that uses jQuery uh, and JavaScript on the client side and a bit more. So, some of the, well, most of the things we will do in that moving that application, the to-do application, will have to do with uh, well, questions which are being asked on the seaside mailing list a lot about how can I do this and how can I do that with jQuery in Ajax and combine it with JavaScript. So we'll move, uh, we'll move through that. And then um, Philippe is going to show us a bit more about new stuff which uh, came into Seaside 3.1 which was released in uh, the beginning of this year, which is the RESTful component filter and the session tracking strategy. So that's the second part of the talk. And then depending on how much questions and how fast we actually go, we also want to show the GS DevKit work, which is then bringing up your Seaside in a gemstone, which is the new way, well, they has been working on GS DevKit, which is the, the new way if you worked with Glass before, this is then the new way to bring up your Seaside gemstone installation. So and of course your could, questions. Me, could you show again? Yeah, I will. And then your questions. So the, the thing is, uh, if you have Faro 3 installed, you don't need to do the first item, but we put up a zip file containing a Faro 3 image you can download, which has Seaside 3.1 preloaded, including the code you need for the tutorial walkthrough. Because the idea is probably about showing, uh, me showing you to walk through this uh, application. Because if we would all have to like, do exercises, it would probably take a bit too long. So we'll, uh, we'll actually walk through and you can follow on your laptop by taking a look at the application, playing with it, see, taking a look at the codes where I'm showing it. If there are questions, please do so in an interactive style. If you cannot follow somewhere or have more questions about something, please raise your hand. Um, so I'll just keep talking until everybody <laughs> gives a ping and he downloaded the image file. Ping, 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 ping. Great. Okay. So, uh, good. Does everybody at least have the URL so you downloaded the zip file? Yes. No, no, no. Okay, I'll wait, I'll wait. No problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so actually I'll do the same thing on, on screen so that you can follow uh, the steps to reason why we do some certain stuff and so on. Okay, so if everybody downloaded the zip file and then you should be able to start it up in your Faro tree and you get you get something like this. I did put up a little larger larger fonts. But you should actually have your system browser open on the Seaside examples category, and that's a package. It's not the standard Seaside examples one, it's one which was augmented. Uh, and there should also be a Monticello browser open, pointing you to there is a, a repository, but don't go in there yet, but you'll be it later on, which is the small talk hub, you have to show Seaside Playground, which is just a repository I put there for the tutorial, which has the, the changes. But we'll walk through. And also, you open up your web browser and you go to eight, localhost 8080, you go to the standard Seaside, which will probably give you the welcome screen, but you need to navigate through the examples, slash examples, slash to do application, which is the one we will be using in this first part of the tutorial. So I'll just take a look if sufficient people have this page open. We need a mirror. I need a mirror, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would be really cool to have like green lights around everyone's head. Okay. So this is this is um, a bit using the 
uh, MVC to do application, which there is a standard application to do for JavaScript and VC frameworks, and because it had the CSS and everything in there, and so like an understood concept, I took it here. Um, and this is this is a, the to do application implemented using more or less because some of the uh, more or less uh, standard C sites where you wouldn't really well you will not be using AJAX updates. So you would do full page renders, right? So you would construct a more or less traditional C site application. But um, there is a bit of uh, so um, you can try and then you can say okay, I first gotta do. Uh, Step one, I'm going to do, and then step two, and then there's the end. So these are the things, and what you see is actually the parameter, the K parameter, which is the seaside continuation uh, parameter, going forward all the time because it's a standard seaside application. Right. There you go. So actually rendering a lot all the time. Now this is fine because it's a really simple application. Actually, you don't really see that the entire page is being run. That's of course the idea here. So that actually works. But if you have an application where your page is a bit uh, harder and a bit uh, more content on it, then actually doing a full page re-rendering will take a lot more time. Right? And also because it's local, this will go fast. So a lot of people ask the question, OK, now I want to do AJAX updates. And I want to make sure if I insert a new to-do, so here you can remove the to-do or you can mark it finished right so this one is uh, actually not doing a page rendering so that's why I say more or less uh, a full <coughs> on the seaside application because you cannot do it here but this one is doing a full, uh, full rendering that's all so if you take a look at the code uh, the first step <coughs> we should actually want to do from this web page to, to really a web application I would say is Ajaxify this to-do application. So let's move out the full page renderings and have Ajax updates when we add a new to-do and when we remove one. So and those two things, they are in WA to-do render at new to-do and WA to-do item render content. So when you take a look at the to-do application, we have the render content on method, which renders the add new to-do on, which is the form input form, then it renders the to-dos and it renders the footer which is empty here. But its rendering of to-dos is generating a section with a checkbox uh, with a, an, uh, a list with all to-dos in there. And each to-do is a separate component, a separate seaside component. Ah, okay. Maybe. Yeah, so it's not really Okay, so part of the application here is the WA to do, which is the root class. And it's really simple. Everything is render at new to do here, and the WA to do item in render content on. And then you have the checkbox. And that's why I say, okay, this is at the moment already we're using a bit of Ajax because they're doing the checkbox. Uh, this requires doing a submit, and you cannot do uh, clicking on a checkbox, and then you would actually, in a normal application, you would need a submit button to submit the form. I didn't want to put that in there, so the checkbox here is actually immediately, when you click on it, it immediately submits the serialization of the checkbox to the server in this case. But the thing we want to remove is if I push the remove button, and this is the, the guy here, you take a look at the WA to do item render content on, here there is a normal callback on the button, being self remove. If I click on the, here, this button, it will actually do a full page refresh, because it's a normal callback. So it will initiate the callback server side, execute the callback, and then render the entire application again. So we want to move that out because we just want to remove that item from the web page and also communicate to the server and don't update anything else. Right? So that's, uh, that's the easy part. Oops. Go here. And then the same thing should actually happen with the render add new to do on. This is also a text input which has a complete callback. And if you actually 
hit the enter button, it will do the submit for you there. So that's, uh, that's what happened. Now I just put this autocomplete attribute on there because otherwise you would have your browser always showing you autocompletes. It didn't look really nice. So this is just something you can put on autocomplete attribute on the text input field to say that it shouldn't do, the browser shouldn't do it. So that's the only reason we do that. So we need to change this. Huh? And now I could invite you all to think about and quickly implement it, but even if you're fast and well, you take like five to 10 minutes looking up the necessary things. So what I did for you is, uh, there's a subsequent version of this Seaside example package. So you've all got version 26 loaded. If you open up the Monticello browser and you open up the repository of the Seaside playground and you can go to version 27 and that will actually transform those two methods. And I'll load them here. Which version did you say? Just uh, the next one, so 27. Yeah, <coughs> this guy. So if you load this one, number 27, in the you want to show a Seaside Playground repository, you open this one of Monticello. Somebody having problems doing that? Maybe not familiar with Firefox. I'm seeing the Monticello, yeah, I'm not very familiar. I'm seeing the okay. Monticello browser and the repository is right 2014, so I just open it. Yeah, not the ESR 2014, that's a package uh, loaded from Philippe. But uh, mine is somewhere else. Yeah, we, we don't some stuff in parallel. Yeah. So seaside examples, you want to show 27. So and that, that actually changes those two methods. Now I've done what any what I see what most people are are very good at, at getting, they take a look at the jQuery website, they take a look at the, the, ja, the jQuery wrapper implementation of Seaside, and this is most of the time what people will actually end up producing. So there's no really, no really any problem for anybody diving in, it appears. But, so what actually got added was this on change callback, which is the a JavaScript function, and it will actually require a JavaScript expression. And we put in there a jQuery, we construct a jQuery Ajax callback. So calling back to the, to the server and saying, well, serialize this. Serialize this means serialize me the field I'm changing. I change it on. This is uh, part of the jQuery documentation, if you take a look at it. So serialize uh, is uh, an existing one. And with that serialize calls on jQuery Ajax, you're actually able to say, well, trigger the execution of this callback, right? So I never changed this callback. This still exists from the previous implementation, where the value I put in the input field comes, and I construct a new to-do, right? So I just execute the same action. So may, yes? I, may I ask a little question here? For a long time, I had this misconception about the fact that serialize this sounds a lot like jQuery.serialize. But serialize does just produce this uh, name value string that you would pass in, in a URL in a callback. <coughs> and in Seaside, serialize this also executes a callback to the server. Right? Serialize this does not only. It will, it will make sure that this callback on the. Here, this callback, if it serialized this, because, okay, I'm opening up, yeah, I'm opening up the implementation of serialize this. Yes. Because it's actually jQuery serialize self jQuery this. So it's taking the this and say, okay, serialize this. But, yeah. Yes. <laughs> serialize that. But the, the, the serialize method in jQuery does not call the server or anything. Serialize in jQuery just uh, produces a name of, the, form. name of the widget equals value of the, of the, uh, of, of the input. Name of the text field equals contents of the text field. Okay. So this, that's a misunderstanding that I had for a very long time. Okay. The serialized method is only presenting the string, is only create, creating the string that you would attach to an URL I have to if you send a, a, a callback. 
It's just encoding. It's not. It's not sending anything. Okay. Yeah. So what actually happens is that um, it serializes these onto the URL being used as the callback right. URL right. in the AJAX. Yes. In the AJAX. So it's uh, serializing the input fields and putting those on the URL because that's how Seaside always works. It puts them on the URL which will be called back. So it's uh, it's saying, well, serialize them, but in this AJAX request, you mm -hmm. see, which is something you need to do manually. Otherwise, if you have the, the standard Seaside implementation, where you would be doing a submit, the submit would also serialize them and then uh, put them uh, in a post request. Mm -hmm. And this guy, serialize this means, okay, or serialize, you can give serialize another argument, or you can serialize form, right? Where you would actually serialize the entire enclosing form. But uh, it means serialize all the input elements uh, inside of the scope I'm giving you. This is a shorthand for serialize the this, or if it's serialized form, you'll see it's in this, and then find the enclosing form. And take all the input elements and serialize them on the URL. That's the technical thing that's happening. And this is also why you can then combine that with other callbacks because you have all the things, all the callbacks are actually serialized on, this, on one URL. But uh, yeah, that's true. Oh, okay. It's actually using the serialized, but it does more yeah, yeah. because it's, uh, it's not the jQuery, it's the Ajax. Yeah. I have a question, uh, a naive question. The, the comma here is just a concatenation of the two HTML. The comma, the comma. Yeah, on complete, you have a comma at the end. Here? Yeah, yeah. This is append. Okay. Uh, this is appending generated JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. The implementation of the jQuery wrapper and the JavaScript generation in Seaside, something I'm kind of more or less assuming people have taken a look at uh, if they're here. But you generate JavaScript. Uh, in C site, and then you attach it to the DOM rendering. So this is what happens here. I'm doing my DOM rendering, doing a text input saying on change, and then this entire expression is actually generating a JavaScript expression, which is a jQuery AJAX call saying serialize me the input elements on the callback of the text input I'm on, and then passing also an incomplete function. Right? So all these things. You have to know more JavaScript and you have to know jQuery a lot before, well for me, if, you're, if you want to do jQuery in Seaside, don't confine yourself to taking a look at the jQuery wrapper. Take a look at the jQuery documentation online and then see what the corresponding elements are in Seaside. And that's how you can do it. Then the mindset, but that's difficult to convey in a tutorial, the mindset about um, what you generate uh, is not immediately executed. You have to know about the difference between your compile time or your generation time and then when it will be executed. So you're just generating pieces of JavaScript you're sending to the web page and then at some point in time it will be calling back. It will execute that JavaScript and that might then call back. So, but that, that mindset, uh, this is what happens here. On, on change it will execute this Ajax call but the incomplete argument, and that's a jQuery uh, option for the AJAX call, will only get executed when the AJAX request is complete. And from there, what most people then do, okay, you first need to send this value so that you make sure that this callback got executed server-side. But it's, a, it's an AJAX callback, so no, no rendering is going to happen uh, if I do that. So if I, that, that's, that's just, uh, let's just, out. And then of course, this. So in this uh, setting, I have to reload. In this setting, I just left the incomplete out. So step, step one. Uh, yeah. So I'd actually got serialized server side. And if you don't believe me, I'll just. I'll put a halt here. No, I hope it, yeah. So there's a halt here. So actually, if I only do this, the callback happens server side and it gets executed here, but that's everything the browser does. It just does an asynchronous request. It does nothing else. But then, yeah. 
please stop me if I'm, if I'm disturbing too much, but um, I have an internal question about the callback, because the callback is a VA value callback that you define by giving a callback to, to, to the text input. Right? Yeah. That's going to be registered as a, as a WA value callback. Yeah, this is While natural. if you have this on change and, and make a call to jQuery Ajax, you're going to create a uh, JS Ajax callback, right? Yeah. How come that, that JS Ajax callback will use the VA value callback, WA value callback to serialize, to, to actually send the stuff out to the server? So that's a uh that's deep in the implementation, but what actually happens is the serialize this here puts the name of this value callback on the URL, and when it comes into Seaside, it detects that that callback is being mentioned on that URL, and that's why it's going to execute it. Oh, I, I, tried to, I tried to do the same trick in a completely other setting. Okay. Somehow all the value callback got, got uh, Ignored by, by the. Okay, uh, we have to take a look then, but, maybe. But, but, but that's, what, that's what actually happens because here. you're actually putting a lot, you can actually uh, put a lot of callbacks on the same yeah. and just Seaside executes the things which are coming in. But there's a. Sometimes I like to learn by examples and by looking at the JavaScript code in the browser. Yes. In the Chrome debugger. Yeah. Can you show us uh, where that lives? Okay, so this is then the Chrome the debugger I'm opening. You have the sources, and then there's the to-do. Uh, should be ah, on change. That's on change is just attached to the yeah. So there is a difference between scripts being um, added to the to the DOM using the script message, uh, because the on change message I'm sending here, it's. Uh, it's attached to the input element, so it's in, in, in place, it's not that I, okay, I keep forgetting that name. But it's actually attached here, so it's in line. So, so it's actually in here. Of the, of the so this is the, it's a bit more, I need to okay, open it up, and then you see here, on change, yeah, no, it's, I have the on change completely right now. Yeah. So this is the entire on change, it's an Ajax request, but this is really small. But this lives in the DOM, in this case. Now if you have, uh, if you are using, and, and later on we have some, um, if you're using the script tag to attach something to the DOM, it's going to live somewhere else. It's going to live in uh, the onload script being loaded in the beginning of the document. But I think they're a little bit later, but don't think about those anymore, but I can find them, I can show you. Does this answer yes. the question? Yeah. But there's, um, I mean, if, I, if I have others, coming up, then I can show you already. And if you don't, so the, the, that's an often uh, coming up, uh, that's an often question that comes up, can I maybe see pretty printed JavaScript uh, in, my, in my browser? Because okay, serializes it, and actually it also encodes the JavaScript. So um, what, what you can do, and what I think uh, works best, is you have this little tag in Chrome, and you also have it in Firebug, in Firefox, is you can format the incoming JavaScript so it, the browser can pretty print the JavaScript for you. So it doesn't work really well if you're debugging because you cannot debug the pretty printed one. But okay. So, okay. So in order to then change the page, we need to put the newly generated to-do in our to-do list. And that's something we do once we send uh, the serialization to the server and made the new to-do server side. So when this block got executed, what happened is the add to-do method, and this one changed a bit as well, so I'm creating a new to-do item and I'm returning it. That means, and then I assign this value to the temporary variable. Now this is because we have full closures in Faro. If you're doing this in Gemstone, you need some uh, little trick workaround, and I don't know if it works in every other uh, small talk implementation. But what happens is we can communicate values between different callbacks. Because here I'm generating another callback, so on complete, we're going to execute another Ajax call, which is a script callback, meaning that this guy will render a script to be executed uh, client side. And this is a jQuery script that does DOM manipulation. So if you don't know jQuery well, then this is, uh, this is a bit more difficult. But what it's doing is, okay, I'm taking 
the item with an ID to do list, which is the guy rendered in the render to dos. And I'm just going to append the new to do item. Okay? So I can send here something a renderable. The jQuery wrapper in Seaside, where you can pass on something to put some HTML, and you can put any renderable. A Seaside component is a renderable. So I could also make a block here to make it more explicit, saying, well, R, which is what most people do, yeah? and you could say R, render new to do. Or you can just pass in the new to do. Right. This is the same. And then, with the comma here, as you mentioned, this is just an append, meaning just another statement. I'm appending another statement to my generated JavaScript. What it does is the content of the thing of the uh, with the element with new I, uh, new to do, I just put a value with an empty string, meaning I will just empty the input field. So those are the two things I do once I created a new to do item on the server side. I only that part I append to the list, and I put it. So that's if you execute it, this guy. So I just do step one here. So and then I don't have any full page renderings anymore. So this is all easy. That's what you mostly do. Then the same thing for the to-do item. If I want to delete, so I changed the callback of the button to an on-click handler. So again, this one is generated inside of your DOM. The non-click handler, which is then again going to do an AJAX request. And this is just a callback doing the same thing, remove. So, but it will not trigger a read page rendering when Seaside is, has processed that, because it's an AJAX. And then I will just remove the thing with the ID, ID which is my sub. So this is the delete, the delete button. And then that's something I didn't implement in the first version because okay, in place editing without Ajax stuff is uh, too difficult. Here is an in place edit. Um, and I will use that to show you really things I will normally not write uh, because they, but they show a lot of possibilities, but they become really complex. So I will normally not write them and use actually JavaScript, handwritten JavaScript. Uh, I include in my, in my web application. But it will show you some things. So here I put the text input um, has changed. And I put on a callback so you can actually change the name of your to-do, which is in this version. So I can actually click on one, and I can change the name and change its name. So, so that was that's a new thing I had. Same thing, I added a callback on that text input. And then, well, there's a bit more here, because this text input is initially hidden. And when you click on the label which shows your to-do item, it will actually hide this one and show it. Show this last edit one. Okay. So you have this script here, which is just static, statically generating on click handle. Okay. I need to put in all these things, because that's what people do. Uh, one question. Uh, um why do you need uh, the callback? Because I both the callback and the on change are called. So, uh, we're not, uh, I don't know, but it's not just a to call. make it's it not a block. Okay. Yeah. Just to, yeah. because this is, I could do it. You could, you could actually also say callback with value and get the value from the text input, but then I will, like, actually, I would make it more complex. So, I'm just putting in the callback on the text input and then on change you serialize it. So, if you, then you at least keep your traditional seaside callbacks where they are supposed to be logically. And you serialize it, and on complete, okay, I will find the label and I will do a load, which is a jQuery Ajax load with an HTML, and here I do the render myself description, and then change the hiding the field again and putting it up, okay? So those are the steps you need to go to. I click on the label, the label gets hidden, the text input uh, field appears, and then if I type something in uh, the on change event descent, which is on enter or on blur, if you move away the keyboard focus from the, uh, from the input field, 
the trigger won't change, meaning serialize me the input field, and if that's complete, I find myself the label, and I really put in the name in the label, I put the value that I just typed in, because you have to do all that manually, because nobody's re-rendering your page. You have to manipulate your DOM. That's what you do here. And this will degenerate later on. Yeah. Excuse me, so the callback R render self description. Is this uh, executed? Uh, this must be executed on the server. Yes. And is it when if, if, if when the page gets created, not on the on complete? So no. Before. This no. This this is executed. Uh, this is executed after. Uh, no, no. This is this block. This block is only executed huh, when this callback gets uh, invoked. So on complete. Will initiate the callback to get this rendering. This is not. This is not what I put on the. I, it's not done when Seaside renders the page and produces this. It will not execute this block, which is why it's in a block. Which what would be the mistake is this. Because then, if I would execute this callback, he would just put the old description, right? But you wrap it in a block, which is only evaluated when the Ajax call, the load, load is an Ajax call, jQuery load is an Ajax call, expecting HTML, it's actually a shorthand for if you have an HTML element and you want to replace its contents, the inner contents of that, you can easily use the jQuery load because you actually say, well, the element with the ID, uh, I'm, what I do here is I do, okay, I do a jQuery expression, I take, I look for the element with this ID, meaning myself, and I find the label, which is this. So the list item has this ID, and then I find the label inside, client side. This is executed client side. And then I do a load, which means replace the content with whatever I get from the Ajax callback. And that Ajax callback here is executed at that moment, not when this gets generated, but which is an often made mistake sometimes. Yeah. If you, yeah. But this is, this is called on the server, obviously, because it's small yeah. But um, does it get called after the after the callback, which sets the description? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll come to that in the, the next step. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why I'm using the incomplete. You don't need to use the incomplete. But. So this is just making explicit to first you need to execute that, and then it's going to call back. Right. But that's exactly the problem. So we will just neatly go to that. If you take a look at the network requests which actually happened, so I just add a new one. You see that there is two requests from the client going to the server while I'm just doing adding one to-do item. Now that's not such a problem, but okay, this is one too much. I could just send the thing to the server and get the response back, what to do. But because what you do, what I've done here in rendering add you to do is on change serialize this and then I said to the Ajax callback when it's complete do another Ajax callback so that's exactly what I was trying to do right? but most of the people say well you first need to serialize so I need to ensure that I execute this callback and then only then I can get the new value the new to do and render it so I send it back but you can combine those things right? so So we went through the first step. Now we want to reduce the uh, requests. And this is also the, just a gotcha. If you take a look at all the Ajax examples in, 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 the, in there, they actually all do it, but no documentation mentions it. So uh, this is one of the most asked questions or, or, or stuff on the mailing list. You can combine the callbacks you put onto one Ajax callback. Because you have a difference between primary Ajax callbacks and secondary ones. And the way I remember this is the primary ones, they actually produce a response. You cannot have an Ajax callback both producing HTML and JavaScript, or producing two HTML things. You cannot put two HTML rendering or two script rendering blocks, callbacks, onto one request. So the response is the primary callback. And there's a bit of an exception to that, because at least uh, most of us would say, okay, a single callback one, is actually not producing any response, so it's a secondary callback. But actually, uh, in the implementation, so the jQuery Ajax callback 
one, if you use the callback one, that's a primary callback. So you cannot put multiple uh, just callbacks without any response on there. Maybe this is something to change and, and improve. <coughs> Uh, so all the response rendering callbacks, script, HTML, JSON, which will be in there as of 3.1.3, uh, text, respond, of course. You can only do one per Ajax request. Okay, So you cannot put multiple script uh, callbacks on there. But all the other ones, meaning callback value, and then all the, other, all the others build on top of that, meaning callback JSON, callback passengers, and so on, so you would be executing a callback with an argument, you can do multiple ones of that and the serialize star, so all the serialize uh, messages. So, we've been actually using those, so if you load the next step of the to-do application, then you can follow. Uh, I left in my comment. So, I commented it out. So I'll just, I changed the on complaint. Maybe it's actually good to have the... Sorry, are we on version 28 now? We are on version 28, yeah. Just the next version of Seaside Examples. So we are going to 28, yeah. So that's the second step. Reduce your Ajax callbacks. Because, for example, in our application, we would, have, we would try to chain a lot of... We would have many different methods generating JavaScript, and then we reuse those and we create one big response and we could easily have five or six callbacks with naive combination of JavaScript and we could have easily have five or six just for a single action. So using this technique, we can all reduce that to a single one or just a couple. So reducing this is really easy. You serialize this and then you specify the response rendering callback. So I just put them onto a single Ajax callback in here. The on complete is still there. Why? Because this is just this is not doing any callback. This is just statically generated. Well, this is generated JavaScript, which can be executed anytime. So I could, if I generate this script, uh, this is the new script which is containing values which it only knows uh, uh, during that Ajax request. But I know that first the serialization will happen, and the last thing that will happen, the last block that gets executed, is the response rendering. So you can actually rely on the same technique, first serializing, it will always do this. And as the last callback that will get executed is the response rendering callback. So I can get the latest value of the new to do in this case. I, can, I see a lot of question marks coming up. Everybody still there? Could you, could you change the, the order of these messages without any side effects. I mean, could you put the on complete before the script? I mean, I understand yeah. that the serialized should, should be before, but... Well, this is just this is just the, the natural order of writing things, but if you take a look at jQuery Ajax, which is the G object we are constructing, um, it's just messages being sent. So, the uh, on complete is here, but this is, uh, this is just putting options on the object before it's actually attaching them to right. the DOM here, and then Seaside will serialize it. So you're building up an object with all the properties and then you're attaching it to the DOM and ser um, Seaside will serialize it and it will uh, you, so you, so can, the you can put the order doesn't have it. Yeah. Um, well, but there's only one one complete. So if I want to yeah, yeah, get a second field to uh, yeah. uh, then I have to combine this into one. one. Yeah. yeah, there's if you if you do another one complete, you overwrite it. That's the same if you would have here ID and you would put an ID later on, you overwrite it. Yeah, that's the same. I don't do this. I understood that on change is each time you type a character. No, that's on input. Ah, okay. On change is triggered when you do an enter, or your keyboard focus moves away from the from the text field. So a tap or an enter. That's actually the most asked question. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there is of course a, a lot more JavaScript knowledge required if you do these things. Yeah, that's true. So I'll just I just show the the part from the seaside part how. How to use them, right? So that's the. But okay, th these questions should come up. Okay. How will it look like if I want to have a second new to do two set to empty string? So I have to uh, combine this. Uh, is, uh, how would look? Well, how would be the, the syntax be for that? So just with a comma and then. What would be? What, what uh, if they are a new to do two value uh, empty string? 
That's a, a second, a a second, second, uh, a second uh, element to the incomplete. Ah, I would, I would, I would append them to the first okay, complete. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this guy. Yeah. You mean like this? Wait. No. Maybe that. This. Yeah. That, that's the way I would do it. Um, would right now, some yeah. kind of separator still. Well, the comma of if you append JavaScript, uh, JavaScript objects generated uh, oh, in C site, if you the comma operator is actually defined as uh, putting in a separator. Uh -huh. So you can every every expression you make um, constructing this. This is one Ajax uh, uh, call. This is a, a jQuery expression. But if you then concatenate that with another expression, this can be any JavaScript expression you generate. Mm -hmm. um, it puts a, a separator in between, so a, a semicolon. Right? So that's that's how it works. Now. A lot of people try to generate all their JavaScript here. Don't do that. I think you can use the JavaScript generation facilities to generate those parts where you need something to be generated based on server-side data. Um, I, I'm not using it here, but if you are if you require a larger JavaScript program to be to have in your Sys application, write it in a, in a text editor in a file and use it in a, by calling, for example, a function. So create a function. In JavaScript and then call that. So you can you can easily do those things. Call that function in the generated JavaScript. But don't try to generate all your JavaScript because it's not meant for that. It's really meant for wrapping a bit of JavaScript around uh, generated callbacks or whatever you around jQuery stuff you generate. You, uh, that's a, that's a, an often seen mistake as well. Right? So um, <coughs> for the to do item, I had a. Oops. Same for the to-do item. Uh, yeah, so maybe maybe I should also talk about serial as this with hidden, but maybe everybody knows it. this is something specifically required by Seaside. If you want to serialize a checkbox or a multi-select uh, list field, Seaside generates a hidden input element. So if you use jQuery to serialize it, if you just say serialize this, it will not work. So this guy is a checkbox. If you want this callback to be executed, it won't work if you do this. You have to do this. Okay? This is uh, something to remember if you try to serialize using in jQuery Ajax serialization, the checkbox. That's a gotcha. But, I mean, those are the things I want to convey here. Would, you, would you say that it hurts if you do serialize with hidden every time, no matter what? Um, because then you, you could can just have ex unexpected results because what the okay. serialize with this with hidden does is it actually relies on the fact that the next guy is the hidden input it needs. So <coughs> most of the time you won't have a problem, but if you have a hidden input right after, so if we have a text input here, so here text input, and I would generate a hidden input here. Ah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, See? Then, then you would do serialize this with hidden. This guy would also get serialized. You might not want to know to have that. But okay. yeah, I mean, 99% of the cases would probably work. Yeah. But uh, it's good to know how the serialize this with hidden works if you're using it. So would you possibly have to give this special C side element that's going to be serialized for the checkbox a certain CSS class so that you can filter that out in that expression in within serialized with hidden so that you can get rid of this distinction between serialized and serialized mm -hmm. with hidden, you know where I want to go to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think a, that's a yeah. Oh, that's a feature that's request. <laughs> that's a feature request. It's a feature request. Yeah, but I think it's a very sensible. We gotta go to code machines. Yeah, you don't want me to uh, contribute code from VS Smalltalk alone. Why don't you have blocks? Does VS Smalltalk have blocks? No, 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 of course not. Anyway, so the, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to try to uh, filter those things out. Yeah. I mean, I just, well, see no, it's not your fault. I mean, it's been done yeah. 10 years ago, so. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, same thing here, serialize this and have a script callback, right? So I, I just, really easy, easy thing to do. Uh, where's my, sorry, here. Yeah, the callback here and the incomplete, they remain because this is just, uh, so removing, removing um, an element was just an incomplete but static, 
static script, so then nothing changed here because I wasn't combining any Ajax callbacks. Um, but for the in-place uh, editor, I could also combine it. They had two callbacks as well, so that's easy. Then, uh, this is nice huh, because things are working. I have uh, reduced the load on my server. But then, uh, this is something we came up with. Uh, well, we came, we hit, it's just, we use this standard seaside rendering. You have callbacks everywhere and scripts everywhere. And then, uh, this is a yes plan calendar just growing because uh, there are lots of weeks open, lots of columns, so they have more than 200 locations. One to two months open, you make the multiplication, the amount of cells there are in such a calendar. And then think about, we have an in-place edit for the name of each uh, cell, for, for the a group name here. So there's also, I think you can click on this one, click on this guy, double click here. There's some hidden things you don't see here, like you know, this one, these are also click handlers. Um, oh, summary coming up, there's drag and drop on there. Drag and drop I won't show, but there is a way to, to optimize there as well with jQuery++. But, uh, I mean, we have a lot, there, there's click events here, so you have a multitude of uh, JavaScript and callbacks being generated for each of those cells. And we can, uh, we can simulate that uh, in the to-do application. Because if you go to the initialization of uh, WA to do, I have an expression there which will pre-fill the list of to-dos for you with 5,000 elements in this implementation. Right? So the, where we have uh, the scripts on the label, on the checkbox, and everything. So if I go to to do, so it actually the response here of this to do web page, I cannot make it larger, but it's six megabytes. And it took just from a local load 3.38 seconds. Uh, do that over the network, do that multiple users, do that with a even bit more complex web page and just these little to do's. You got completely irresponsive uh, website. Right? So the thing is too large because we generate too much scripts per element. All these things are on there, so you CCs need to serialize and you need uh, the connection. I mean, if you have five megabytes over a normal collection, it would take one second. So people will see. So how to do that? Now, how to stay with creating and generating server-side scripts? Uh, and actually deal with this problem. And that Seaside actually has a nice combination. I think we will we'll look for a, a way to even better incorporate it, but um, I used the things which are there in current Seaside right now, and those are passengers, right? So you register a passenger object for each of the generated cells server-side, so you know this is the guy. And this guy has the callback, so you can do all that server-side, all the callbacks exist. This is what they do in standard JavaScript applications as well. Even if you do it client-side, registering all these handlers client-side will be noticeable if you execute your JavaScript application. So it's not something exclusively to be done in a server-side handler. Um, so what they do is they put just, you, you need just one handler to register the on-click event. But you let the event delegate, if you click on this cell, you let the event delegate to some higher element in the DOM, you capture it there. And do where you do, so you have one click handler, and that one you communicate back to the server, but you pass on the original receiver of your click event. And server side, you can do in C-side the passenger lookup, so you get the cell, and you just execute the callback which you generate for that cell. So, that's the, the final version you need to load if you go to the repository again and you load the version 29. I should put them in separate methods. I thought this would be easier, but okay. No. So if you have version 29 and you go to the render to do's on method in uh, WA to do. I register three script handlers on the element of the unordered list, so our 
DOM element wrapping around all the list items which are the do items. I run the three, uh, three handlers, right? One for the delete, to catch the click on the delete. One for the click on uh, the checkbox. And then one for the click on the name itself to open the uh, in place setting. So I don't change the render input all because that's just, it's just one element, right? The callbacks for the text input field where you add a new to do item. That's fine. You can uh, leave those on. It's the scaling of your amount of to-dos you want to tackle. So there's the, the thing in jQuery has this uh, support for, for registering uh, delegated events. You can register the handler and say, well, on some event I captured uh, coming from, uh, from a certain element below me and execute this JavaScript function. So it does a callback from jQuery is uh, executing a JavaScript function. But we can generate that. So this is the guy. This is the, so I removed I removed the the entire scripts which get generated on uh, let, let's take the destroy. This is a, a better one to explain. So I removed the click handler on the remove button and I put it here. But what I did is I rendered I uh, added the passenger. If you go to render content on a WA to do item, you see that I added this guy, passenger itself. So I registered for the list item, I register a passenger C site saying, well, just putting myself in there. So I know that the element associated with the list item on the web page is this WA to do item instance. Okay? So I can access it. If I am in render to do's here. Okay. So I say to jQuery, if you take a look at the on do uh, jQuery on method, that's the that's the documentation you need to understand what's going on, but I tell you, on some event named click, happening on something with a class destroy, which is a cross on my to do item, has a CSS class destroy. So this is registered on top of the on top of uh, the list item, so on the unordered list element. But if I click on the list item, on the web page, events, they bubble up. So if there's no handler, well, if there is a handler, but if they always go up. So the eventually unordered list knows there's a click event on a list item. So this is what we capture. And I capture only those which are done on element with CSS class. So I can put any jQuery selector here, but I capture those on a destroy CSS class. That's a filter. I only filter those click events. Yeah. Is this going to be a find on, on the jQuery JavaScript side? Is this going to be a find method? Is it going to be uh, ID of the list dot find? No, this no, is? no, no. This is actually the the here jQuery on. This is the the exact API of jQuery on. Uh, so no, it's not gonna. It's probably gonna do. No, no, it's not gonna do a find, but. As a parameter to on, it takes a look at the. Uh, it takes a look at the. Uh, so when the event goes up, it captures it on the unordered list element, and then it will take a look at the original target of my click event. Does it have the destroy class? So it will actually match that to the jQuery selector. Um, yeah, here this is this is the jQuery method for which there is the. So you have uh, the events, a selector, then the data. Mm -hmm. So you can do multiple things there. Yeah. Uh, the passenger that you mentioned. Passenger cell, is that rendered somehow in the HTML like a hidden field? As an ID. As an ID, but a hidden one, right? No, it's visible. Yeah. It's, it's, visible. Uh, it's visible. Yeah. Well, uh, the ID of the element is uh, is visible in the web page. So if you take a look, here is my list item. Dun, 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 dun. Where is he? Here. Ah, okay. You know, the one that see it very well. But it's ID 10, right? And the next one will be ID 17, 24, 31, 38. So these things are auto generated. So the, the HTML element that encapsulates the whole the whole item. The well, the element, uh, the HTML element I attach the passenger to. Yes. It gets the ID, and this is how Seaside retrieves the passenger because it takes a look at the ID. There's something to mind. You can put an ID on an element and then put a passenger on it because if you have uh, an ID and you attach a passenger, it will Seaside will associate that passenger with the given ID, but if you do the inverse, and I've done it sometimes, and then you can just look for the error, 
If you first attach a passenger and then you attach an ID to your element, boom, you will never find it. Seaside won't find your passenger anymore. So somewhere we should actually maybe throw an error for what. <laughs> but uh, so you will actually overwrite the ID. So if you attach, a, if I do this, like, instead of showing text in air, I, uh, if I do this, like, but of course, ID should always be unique on web pages. So that, that's then your mistake. But if I do like a foo bar one, okay, and I attach a passenger, Seaside will find your passenger because it will say, well, the the uh, ID foo bar one is this passenger. If you do the inverse, at the moment, at least, if you do the inverse, setting the passenger will set an ID on the list item, but which you overwrite afterwards. That's a problem, right? So this is a this is a bug you could you could. Uh, like that. And if the first time you assign an ID, then the passenger, it will keep the ID that yeah. you first assign. Okay. Yeah. If there's no ID to generate one, yeah. if there's already one, uh, one to take. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as I render to do's. Okay, so on the click of destroy, execute this function. Right. Uh, yeah. So and then the function actually is, uh, you have uh, in the JavaScript generation, you can take any JavaScript expression you generate and then you send it the message as function. And this is here, yeah, it's on the next line. Hopefully in your, in your screen you can see it in one line. But I say as function with as a uh, parameter event, okay? So and that means to wrapping the generated JavaScript expressions and put it inside the function. And that's the thing it will attach to the do handler here, right? And that's an Ajax expression, doing a callback, okay? Passengers, a callback with the passengers uh, argument, okay? And the passengers, I just need to write a jQuery expression to the element which is my passenger. In this case, well, I'll take a look at my event target closely. Now this expression, I'll probably look into making uh, a little bit easier because it's repetitive, but actually always the same. You say, okay, it's a jQuery, I take my original event target, and from there I go to the closest Lee element, right? But this part might probably be, I change the future versions to make this event delegation even like less code, right? But the principle will still be the same. I get the closest Lee, and this is the like, callback passengers. The second argument expects a jQuery expression pointing to the DOM elements that actually represent your passenger. So it will take the passengers from those one, so it finds the closest list element, and then passes it on here. Right? And then actually there's only one, so I take it and I remove. Okay. And then on complete, I do the same thing. I remove the element list item from. from it. So the closest is actually uh, looking for the children, like jQuery find child of the call. Uh, the closest. Closest. Closest is uh, up. Up. Closes the up. Yeah, it closes up. Yeah, because the event target is uh, inside of the list element. It's, it's actually on the destroy button, which is nested. Ah, yes. And I put my passenger on the entire list item. Right? Okay. So that's, uh, that's the thing. It doesn't think you execute, but that's what you do. This is what you would do if you write it on the client side immediately. Right. Uh, same thing happens here. On the, if you click the toggle, you do the serialize with hidden on the event target. You see, this is always the same jQuery expression, this is what I write as well everywhere. The thing is, I do our application, which I build a thing around it which works for us. Now the idea is to uh, transfer this to Seaside as well. But uh, you always do the same thing, expression on the event target, and then from there you do normal jQuery construction. Then let me go to the in-place editing. So for the in-place editing is also a problem because there's also like, lots of script being generated. And this is not something I would normally write. I would then, this, this is where I would make the reflection, okay, create a client-side JavaScript function to call instead of building all of this and, and pass in the necessary items you need. But the same thing I can do if I click on the label, huh, I could execute, uh, I can execute this find and show element, uh, uh, hiding the label and then showing the text input. Okay, that happens here. This is a, an easy one. But then what you need to do, and if I don't want to uh, include the serialization script on every generated text input field, this is what you can do, <laughs> but you shouldn't. 
no, uh, to give you an idea about combinations of Ajax and everything. So I will actually register on the change event on the element which is uh, class CSS class edit and then execute this function. Oh, <laughs> three or five. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> this is very I think you have this Yeah, yeah I have been problems since yesterday with my computer. It seemed to boot again, and then uh, now, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually dead. Oh, I think you need to to your You have a plan signal for his yeah. bit. <laughs> Perfect time. True, yeah. Well, it's, and it's already three, so yeah. I think I'll leave it to Philippe. Your opportunity to buy new pack. There was a couple of other things I was uh, intending. If you go and take a look, you find a D3GS package as well loaded in the image. Um, so there's two things you sometimes need to do if you work with external JavaScript uh, libraries, which is you need to give them a URL where they can take the JSON or whatever, or you need to give them a JavaScript function. So there is code in there in the D3GS. Actually, I can bring it back up so I can quickly. Uh, to show you how you can uh, create your own callback and then uh, get a URL for it to pass uh, in a JavaScript function. So the thing with what, every, what, what jQuery, Ajax, and everything do behind the scenes is also they generate a URL they pass on. If that comes back into uh, Seaside, it will execute the callbacks. Well, how can you create your own callback block and then get the URL for it? And uh, it keeps on rebooting right now. So, but given the already lengthy time, I will just first pass on to you. Yeah. The last version of the package, I think it's got something wrong. It comes up with a, a message not understood. The CSS would be. Oh yes. Yes, ah, right, yeah, okay, well, yeah, uncommon to serialize this within it, it won't work. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, for the in-place edit, as I said, this is a, more of a, more of a showcase for uh, how you can combine all that stuff. Uh, but I actually had to write another serialize, serialize this with hidden uh, and whatever, yeah, yeah, true. Well, well, what, and, there's, and there's one in the, oh, it doesn't matter, we'll find it out. Okay, so. The missing method. It's well, not, not intentional that we, we crash at the same time. version. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and the uh, jQuery plus plus stuff for it, I can hope. Uh, yeah, right. given it was a bit short to show all that. Um, can we do a screencast on that? Uh, I can, yeah. Yes. Uh, I can, I can. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually easy. easy. Oh, I see. There's the So I'll cover some of the uh, advanced things in Seaside that are new in V1. Um, I'll talk about the RESTful component filter and session tracking. All the code that I show is uh, found on the second link. And for those that have not been uh, in Ghent, the um, co code is on the first link. On the second link is uh, a micro framework that you Built using Seaside without sessions and combinations and anything. It's just if you feel like you want to build your own micro framework without having to build all the SGP infrastructure, that's something that you could use as a starting. So, RESTful component filter. Important disclaimer if I talk about REST in this context, in this presentation, I mean pretty early. Usually, this means something else, but in this presentation, it's pretty gross. So, <laughs> RESTful Compound Filter is new in 3.1. It's a fault of Notary. He's there. <laughs> and um, it doesn't really have a lot of documentation. On the other hand, it doesn't also have a lot of code. It's three methods and ten lines. So, which problem does this for component filter solve? If, uh, if you have a web page that has one or several static front or landing pages that are just static or mostly static content that you want to operate without having a session, for example, because 
they get crawled by some web crawler and you don't want to create a new session for every request that's made. Also it gives you um, a central place to recover from all session and recover all the controls. So you could run several static pages at the front of your application landing pages, but behind that have dynamic pages that use C site sessions and call back. And back, back in so, that Pokemon mm -hmm. filter is normal REST filter that's wrapped around the application. So, it's not wrapped around the component as the name may imply. It's uh, wrapped around the application and it only runs when there's no active session. So, if there's an active session, um, it runs, but not run. Um, or if there's a session but it's expired, uh, then it runs. Or if there's no session, it also runs. Um, and it can start a session. So if you are on a page that needs to start a session because you want to have callbacks, then you can start a session and it starts with a compound instance. And you can dynamically create and uh, select your compound instance. Uh, if you start from W application, then your root component class is complete in the application. But here you can dynamically create a component instance of any class and that will be used to start a session. The normal um, rules for uh, REST filters in CSAT apply. These are actually documented in the, the contract the resolution rules. And since it's a filter, and the component, you somehow need to generate the HTML yourself. Uh, you can use WA Builder or WA Painter. But you have to remember you can't use callbacks. Because you don't have a session, you can't use callbacks. So you have to manually need to build your rows and find out what you want to do. I have two examples. The first example is a counter example. Uh, it's not that representative because um, all the state of every page, if you so want, is handled by both the filter and the component. Normally, you just would have uh, a fraction that's handled by the filter and most of the things handled by the component. And our drawback is that the example is not composable, so it just works through one country on the page. If you have two countries, it won't work. Out counter, and there are two changes that are not on the normal counter. The first is uh, update URL, that's the URL that's displayed when rendering that component. And the difference is it does add the current state, appends that to the URL of the application. And then um, on the increase and decrease links, it will add, it will pop the current counter state and push the next counter state. So um, if you are on page 5 with state 5 and have 5 in the URL, increase link would have 6 in the URL. So if you stay too long on that page, click increase, session expires then you will have six in the request URL so that you can report from that and conserve the state that you want to have. And then we have the, uh, the filter that here has just one route. Where's the count in it? Starts the session, initializes the country instance, with the state from your uh, one question. Yes. In the past can you have regular expressions? No. No, you can only have uh, prefix and suffix matches.
So what you see here is we have the current state in Europe, which matches the state on the page. And if you look closely, the increase the we'll have the future state in Europe we all have the same for the decrease link. So if we remove the session and everything and The second example is a more realistic one that is uh, three pages. First page, page just being a static page, link to the second page, the second page also just being a static page, and the third page and being the night page that has a counter on it with session and callbacks. So the last page. That's a normal component that um, represents another component. Um, all it does is we have just the title and then it's the component. And then um, put in the row that is the last page. Then we have the filter. <coughs> What's a bit special in that case is if we have an empty path then we just redirect to the first page. Uh, first page, we're going to have one, and we, um, we generate some HTML. Since we're not starting the whole application session, machinery, whatever, we need to say, okay, what we produce is going to be HTML, and we have an HTML string, and we return that from the entry. And let's see, so it writes that string to response with this content type. So we're just using HTML Builder. We say we want the full document, not just the fragment, and then have a render block. Um, since we don't count use callbacks, we have to manually create the row that we want. So we take the current one, pop the last element, push to on it, that's the to the second page. Second page is similar, the difference is um, we use a uh, painter. Painters kind of look like components, but um, have few features. We have um, a content on method that looks like a normal energy content on in a component. But we can't use callback and we manually create the link to the last page. Again, here we have to set the content type and the string that we created. And then finally, on the third page, we create component instance start session. Since we start the session and application, we don't need to return anything. Uh, we don't need to set the content type. <coughs> so if we go to one to three, we get redirected to the first page, as we to the second page, as we to the third page, the component. We should be crazy to go to Binance or not? No. Um, the, the, um, the component state from the last page is not in Europe. So you see, uh, the only thing we have here from the last page on Europe is um, which page it is. The state itself is not, we just have the session at the conclusion. The idea is that this is like the fully dynamic page with lots of components that you can't or don't want to the state exposed. Uh, so, by any session tracking, uh, 
uh, session tracking used to be uh, implemented in WA application, and the only configuration option that you have is, is a single flag. And that single flag determines that you optionally want to use cookies. Uh, cookies were always optional, and, uh, mandatory, and if you want to change that behavior, you either have to sub subclass application and override the right methods that would be called at the right moment or change the source. But we always have requests from uh, people who want to have session tracking slightly different for their specific use case. The most frequent one was that people want to use only cookies so that they could have cleaners always and never have session ID. So if we want session tracking is new, has been packed out into the dedicated object. We provide several implementations, but you can implement your own way that matches your need. In addition, you also get the callback there and what happens when session is expired and no session can be found. Uh, these are some of the um, strategies that we ship. So we have uh, three fields, which was the old default. Uh, cookies supported, otherwise green fields, that was the old use cookies. We have cookies only, which is um, gives you always clean rows, and cookie for browsers and IP for crawlers, which also gives you always clean rows and uh, should work with crawlers. There are other ones like SSL session and your path parameters that are implemented for any different repository. So Greenfield is like the old way, how it was done by default, and it's just you have the session ID field as a Greenfield. It's very easy for development, you just change the URL and you have a new session. You can have one session per tab, different tabs, different <coughs> sessions, or um, if you paste the session ID to different tabs, and all tabs will have the same session. Uh, you don't go into trouble with any cookie laws, and you don't have any issues with if you're in a pair in certain browsers and you're missing your PDP here. Path parameter is very similar to Prefield uh, in terms of upsides and downsides. It has two small upsides. One is that um, Prefields are ignored in uh, post in form action else. Uh, path parameters are not, so um, pre-fields have to become hidden fields in forms, path parameters don't. Uh, there are some load paths who work with um, path parameters and only pre-fields. Cookies have the advantage that the cookie never shows up, uh, never shows up in access logs, uh, never does show up in the URL, so people can copy the URL and paste it, for example, into an email, send it to a coworker, the coworker can open it and doesn't get the same session. Uh, advantage or disadvantage, depending on the use cases, every tab in the same browser has the same session. And also, crawlers don't accept cookies, generally. IPs is uh, used, that's something that's rarely used, if at all, for uh, session tracking. Uh, one of the upsides is that you can use it for crawlers if you want to give crawlers clean rows and crawlers don't accept cookies. Also note that every browser on desktop will then have the same session. So if you have Chrome open, Firefox open, they will all end up having the same session because they have the same IP. Um, but there are lots of issues like it doesn't work well for mobile clients which may change their IP and doesn't work well for people's behind proxies or NATs because then often you have several people having the same IP. SSL session ID is um, an advanced option. Also has to watch that it uh, never shows up in the early access log. But the downsides are that it needs server support and you somehow have to um, either keep the SSL session alive 
order to make sure that if the browser reinitiates a session that it has to set session ID. Uh, if you use that, you should be very familiar with SSL configuration and also this configuration, so or avoiding this configuration. Again, you can fully customize that, you can implement your own class. Um, what you can do, for example, is you can rename the fields. So you could rename the cookie name, or you could rename the green field. Um, you could even build something that's based on HTTP headers, maybe you're behind a web application firewall or something like that. That presents the ID as an HTTP header. Maybe you want to build something that operates on SSL client certificates. We don't really care. So, the example I'm going to show is um, something that makes C site look more or less like a Java EV server, like let's say uh, Tomcat or JBoss. And uh, you might use that, for example, um, if you have existing HTTP load balancer infrastructure that's built or configured for um, JBoss or Tomcat and you want to piggyback on that. What the example doesn't do is it doesn't show a JVM load. If you want to do load balancing in general there are two main approaches. First approach is uh, what's called session replication. In that case every image has access to all the HTTP sessions. That's usually the case with uh, your gemstone because then session ID is stored. But uh, when everything else, usually the images don't operate on check memory. In general, you don't want to ship continuations from one image to the other. So, what we then often use is what's called sticky load balancing or sticky session load balancing. In that case, all the requests from one session go to one image so you can keep the session state local on that image. One way to do that is if you attach an image ID to the session ID. So in that example here you see the image ID EP42 somewhere in the load balancer configuration there is a setting that says okay image 42 runs on port so and so on that machine. And then the load balancer would know okay if we have an ID that ends with 42, it needs to go to that image. So the example uses a um, path parameter instead of a field field. The name of the path parameter is JSON ID lowercase. And if the browser supports cookie, it will use a cookie named JSON ID or JSON ID uppercase. That's the way that Tomcat does it. So we have a class, that's a subclass of cookie if supported session strategy. If we look at the hierarchy, we have several base classes that provide convenience methods and template methods that you can use a role guide to um, quickly implement what you need. So the methods that we implement is name of the cookie and name of the field. Then we implement key from context as the method that extracts the session ID from the request. We first look whether we have a path parameter in the request context. Since we already implemented the method that returns the name of the field, we don't need to pass that here. And if we have an ID, then we just return the ID. And if not, we search for a cookie. And the name is taken from the return value of that method. Then we implement the method that adds the session ID to an error. We only want to do that if we don't have a cookie. We have a cookie which is used cookies. 
So what we do is we try to look up the cookie again. And only if we don't find the cookie, we add the parameter to the other. And finally, we have to implement a method that's called um, the, um, the no session is found before the session has been expired. And the only thing we do in that case is um, if we have an old cookie or the cookie has a different session ID than the one in the URL, then we delete the cookie and then we just run the default method. Again, we look for the cookie. Uh, we try to extract the session ID from the request. If we have a cookie, and I do no session ID in the URL, or the session ID in the URL and the one in the cookie are different, then we delete the cookie. Registration, we register the counter, we pretend to be a JSP, and we say, okay, that's our new jumping strategy. So, all these examples are also in the image of the yeah. Yeah. CZ automatically sent us the uh, new session copy, which has session ID. And since it's the first link, and CZ hasn't yet get a request from us, it doesn't know whether we uh, accept cookies or not. So the outgoing link also has K session ID in the URL. But the second, the second page, now that CZ knows that we send cookies back, we no longer have it. We only have to cook. So that's it from my side. Session storage for session tracking in the in the HTML file? No, I don't think so. Um, basically, we we cannot really or realistically um, store the um, the the whole session on the client. So I mean, we could store the session ID uh, in local storage, and then somehow it would still have to go the server, right? Either as an HTTP header field or again add it to the URL. And if you add it to the URL anyway, then we can just generate it into the URLs that we send to the client. So for us, uh, you could you could also do an AJAX under the cover, an AJAX request to yeah, but then the AJAX data. Yeah, yeah, but. Yeah. Well, Either we store the whole session. Oh no, no, I didn't mean to set to store the whole session, just the session ID or something. Yeah, but even the, the Ajax call needs to somehow propagate the session ID to the server. Right? Yeah. Either it's in the URL or somehow in the URL. And if it's going to be in the URL, then we can just generate it into the URL on the server. So. Right now, for us, it doesn't look like we will play as much. Um, the uh, another question or comment uh, I have your example or your uh, the name of the session was um, advanced uh, web applications with Seaside mm -hmm. should have been Seaside and jQuery. Do you have anything? Do you have anything that would not be dependent on external libraries that would still use Ajax? Like right now, you have to have to have. 
you have to have, you know what I mean to say, you must have jQuery basically to use um, If you wanted to use straight JavaScript with just HR requests. Um, but you can do it, of course. Um, I just think the jQuery wrapper in Seaside has a, a good integration with it and actually is a, a good library to use uh, to kind of abstract away from any if you want to do your Ajax request yourself. So I don't see any disadvantage in using it. Of course, if you don't want to use it, then you're in for a bit more. Um, yeah, actually, basically, then writing your wrapper for whatever you want to do yourself. Speaking of which, I've been following it, and I commented on, on it in my talk. Uh, keeping track and keeping up to date with all the libraries must be quite a bit of work. Right? Every time a new version of jQuery is out, you have to. Yeah, but uh, otherwise, yeah. Uh, JQuery just helps you because otherwise, each new browser version you have to adapt to. And once and it's more that, changes, so uh, it's much more changes. It's much more changes. So uh, if you use any JavaScript library like Prototype or jQuery, it just save you from from adapting to all the browsers. Yeah. So uh, it would be uh, hell from uh, to to do to try to do in your own. So there's quite an advantage in using jQuery now. There's also a lot of people using jQuery because they don't know the underlying JavaScript API as well. So there's sometimes you you could do without that. That's true as well. It's a nice wrapper, mm -hmm. but. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the same comment that Karsten is saying, it's, it's a layer on top, and actually it used to be auto-generated for previous versions of jQuery. Now the one with Seaside 3, one which updated to the latest jQuery, there's the two, there's jQuery 1, 11, and 2, 1. Probably now I will try to update that again. Uh, we actually have to move to an, uh, a new generation process, but there's ways to take the inscription online and generate the changes. Now, normally jQuery has very few changes in its API, they're well documented, so keeping up with the, the changes is, is quite okay. It was just that there's a whole time where the jQuery wrapper wasn't updated in Seaside, and uh, the jQuery <coughs> version has actually moved a lot of things to deprecation, and especially jQuery UI has changed a lot of methods. So there's quite a difference if you go from Seaside Trio and you use the, the jQuery library and the, the version of jQuery that came with it and you go to Seaside Tree 1, you probably will hit, if you use jQuery UI, uh, you will hit a lot of uh, methods that don't exist anymore. Mm. But um, that's an effort they do right now, and then actually it's a quite a stable API, jQuery itself. So the, the updates there is, is relatively okay. Um, I think between 1.5 and, and, and 1.8, 1 it was just loading a new JavaScript uh, library and put it in there, and the wrapper didn't need any updates because all the fixes were just in the client side value. So yeah, it's keeping the wrapper up to date, of course. And I don't think um, it's our intention to create wrappers for any JavaScript library, which is, uh, if you take a look at the D3 implementation, which is just wrapping it, but D3 is a huge library, but it doesn't make sense to make a wrapper for every function that is available in D3, because that's something you will actually do in JavaScript client side. So you won't want to generate that. But you need a way to couple uh, the, making a call back to to Seaside to get some data. Right. That's in that example. And to respond to Carsten, Carsten, um, I didn't suggest that you should write just raw JavaScript all the time because of the changes in the browsers. But um, I guess one of the motivations for our project was we don't want to be involved in writing wrappers. So you know we want to give people a choice. You want to use jQuery, just load it and use straight JavaScript with jQuery without wrappers. If you want to use D3, just load it and use that. But it's a different thing. Yeah, it would have to have you know, wrappers for each for each framework, but you have to use the and, framework and, otherwise. And, and if you know and for people obviously for people who want to who want end to end small talk solution. Okay. Right? That's like everyone? You <laughs> well, you, I mean, you don't want to deal with the raw JavaScript, basically. So, wrappers are kind of your only way to do that. Is there another talk here, right next to the right after? No, there's coffee break. There's coffee break. Coffee break. I'll just.
whatever D3. So there's, a, there's, there's just a part of the D3 wrapper I was actually implementing for C side. So I just put it in here too. And uh, what it does is this is all client side scripts generated, but it's the C side hierarchy in this, uh, this visualization. So it's the C side packages, C side core here with all the classes. So it just takes that, produces a JSON response, and puts that into the D3 callback. But producing the D3 uh, the JSON response, I create a callback server side, and then I had, I had to pass that URL to D3. And just take a look at the implementation. It's probably a little too. So it's part of the, of the examples of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Right. it's one of the examples of, well, yeah. Uh, if you go to the D3 JS examples, mm -hmm. this is the guy. Well, just HTML script, I create just like jQuery, there's a D3 object you pass on a JSON and on complete, you execute this function, which is doing the D3 stuff. But this is where uh, D3 gets its JSON response, so just the standard C side JSON. Um, all the rest is uh, CSS and uh, JavaScript. But this is the implementation you want to take a look at. What's the URL for a callback, which is in this block? And that's the C site creating the URL, so you actually pass the JSON. And that's the URL of the block, so if you need anybody trying, well, the browser calling that, or D3 calling that URL, will actually execute the thing you give you, which is this JSON call. This is the D3, D3 object JSON. And it stores the JSON callback. These three methods on here is how, if you need to couple with any JavaScript library, which requires a URL to get its data in Ajax, this is the code you need. So I'll probably try to promote this into C side as well because it's always the same. But that's uh, well, you can take a look at it. And otherwise, I'll put it up into the online. But yeah, it, there's no intention of creating any wrapper for the complete uh, D3 library doesn't make any sense. All right, thank you very much.